To understand a region's past, you must know its geography. Before we consider the history of the Trans-Mississippi West, I'm going to take a few minutes to consider the land beyond the Mississippi River. Ray Allen Billington, a significant Western historian, divided the Trans-Mississippi West into 14 provinces, which we'll use in this presentation, although others draw the lines a little differently. We'll start at the Mississippi River, which drains half of the United States, and work our way west, mentioning the significant aspects of each of the provinces. Just beyond the Mississippi, early pioneers moved into a land similar to that on the eastern side of the river. It was rolling, forested, and well watered, and presented no unusual challenges for the early settlers. The central lowlands extend from the Appalachians to the Great Plains, and from Texas to the Canadian border and beyond. The entire area is one of the most productive agricultural regions of the nation, and was being settled by Americans even before Thomas Jefferson acquired the Louisiana Purchase from France in 1803. Throughout the region, rainfall is abundant, and in most places the soil is fertile. To the south, extending from Texas as far north as the Missouri Boot Hill, is the Gulf Coastal Plain, or the Southern Lowlands. Although the crops are different, it too is agricultural. Heat-loving crops such as rice and cane thrive in its subtropical climate. Pine forests provided wood for the first settlers and support a timber industry today. Between the two lowland provinces, the Ozark Plateau is the most mountainous region between the Appalachians and the Rocky Mountains. The terrain made transportation difficult, and the families who moved into the region's narrow valleys were cut off from those who settled in more open country. The next region to the west, extending from Canada to Texas, is often called the Plains, but Billington divides it into four provinces. When the early pioneers reached the edge of this flat, treeless area that grew increasingly arid the farther west they traveled, they decided it was a great American desert and just kept moving on. Billington called the northern plains, drained by the Missouri River, the Missouri Plateau. Part of the region will sustain agriculture, particularly with irrigation. But much of the province is too eroded into badlands for farming. And sand hills make other portions of the Missouri Plateau fit for little beyond pheasant hunting. The one mountainous region within the Missouri Plateau, the Black Hills, caused the last major Indian uprising on the northern plains when officials in Washington reneged on a pledge to allow the Sioux to retain the area as a reservation. Today, the Black Hills are usually associated with the faces of four presidents sculpted into the side of Mount Rushmore. But the land was also shaped by more than a century of gold mining, which cost the Sioux their homeland. South of the Missouri Plateau, Billington divides the plains into three provinces. The region on the east is the Low Plains, also known as the Tall Grass Prairie, for the lush grass nourished by normally abundant rainfall. This grassland supported herds of buffalo that numbered into the millions at one time. After much of the better land was settled, Americans discovered the great American desert was fertile and began settling and plowing it to make room for crops. Beyond the low plains, the pioneers encountered the high plains, where less rain fell and the grass diminished in height. And timber was so scarce that many of the early settlers built with the only material available prairie sod. Farming on the high plains was a gamble that sometimes paid off in a bountiful harvest, but too often the lack of rain meant little or no production. After the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, many high plains farmers turned to irrigation, which produced an unusual landscape for passengers and aircraft flying over the country. Just east of the Rocky Mountains, from Wyoming and Nebraska to the Rio Grande, an upland trough carved by the wind from soil with insufficient grass to prevent erosion forms the western margin of the high or Great Plains. Much of the population of Colorado is located in this region in the shadow of the Rockies. 
On the southeastern edge of the high plains, a region is so flat and featureless, the Spanish gave it a unique name. The Llano Estacado, or Staked Plains. Set off from the lower plains by the Cap Rock, the Spanish are supposed to have erected stakes to keep their bearings as they crossed it. West of the plains, pioneers encountered a mountainous barrier that stretched from Alaska to New Mexico, the Rocky Mountains. The northern Rockies extend from northeastern Washington State to northwestern Wyoming and include most of Idaho and much of western Montana. The Bitterroot Mountains along the border between Montana and Idaho were almost impenetrable and are still one of the areas of the United States least affected by commercial and residential development. Farther south, the majestic Tetons are probably the most striking of the nation's mountain ranges because they rise directly out of the plains with no Piedmont. They also would have been difficult, if not impossible, for pioneers to cross, except for the Snake River that rose on the eastern slopes of the Tetons and carved a broad valley below the northern Rockies that Oregon-bound pioneers followed. Unfortunately, before it merged with the Columbia River, the Snake Valley narrowed into a gorge wagons couldn't follow. Although in 1974, the gorge provided a challenge Daredevil Evil Knievel exploited in an unsuccessful attempt to leap in his sky cycle. Below the northern Rockies is a small but extremely important region, the Wyoming Basin. Actually, an extension of the High Plains, it divides the northern and southern Rockies and is the location of South Pass, an easy route across the Continental Divide on the Oregon Trail. The front range of the Southern Rockies extends south from east central Wyoming to the Arkansas River and the mountains continue into northern New Mexico as the San Grita Cristo, Blood of Christ, range. The front range presents a formidable wall with Long's Peak in the north and Pike's Peak in the south. Beyond the eastern slope of the mountains, other ranges of the Rockies are separated by high valleys called parks. Beaver and minerals attracted early frontiersmen, but the mountainous terrain made travel difficult. Beyond the northern Rocky Mountain province, the Columbia Plateau, covered by lava flows, slashed the hooves of the draft animals of the Oregon-bound pioneers and choked them with dust. Even in this, arid plateau country, millennia of erosion would have softened the landscape, but near the end of the last ice age, a finger of a vast ice sheet formed a dam at Eddy Narrows that backed up glacial Lake Missoula, which held as much water as Lakes Erie and Ontario combined. When the lake's ice dam suddenly collapsed, it sent a torrent of water rampaging along a wide swath to the Pacific. A continental tsunami scoured much of the Columbia Plateau and left behind a moonscape now called the Scablands. Below the Columbia Plateau, pioneers heading to California discover the most inhospitable region of the nation, the Great Basin. Lower than the surrounding mountains and plateaus, the region had no outlet to the sea. The region is mountainous, but with nowhere to go, the alluvial material eroded from the peaks filled the valleys and buried all but the tallest peaks. The region is so dry that only sagebrush, creosote bushes, and cactus can survive. Pioneers heading to California followed the brackish Humboldt River from its source west of the Great Salt Lake across the scorching wasteland to the Humboldt Sink where it soaked into the desert. South of the Great Basin, the Colorado Plateau is a high upland drained by the Colorado River and its tributaries. Broken by deep canyons, the area was bypassed by most of the pioneers moving west. Today, the deepest and most extensive of those canyons attracts tourists to the area. 
Those canyons also provided shelter for the pre-Columbian settlers whose disappearance intrigues anthropologists and historians. The last and most western region is the Pacific Coast Province, which extends from the Canadian to the Mexican border. The region resembles a large capital H, with the coastal mountains of Washington and Oregon forming the northwestern leg and the Cascade Range forming the eastern one. In California, the coastal range forms the southwestern leg and the Sierra Nevada the southeastern. The Klamath Mountains along the California-Oregon border form the crossbar connecting the two legs. A series of fertile valleys separate the two legs, beginning in the north with the Puget Sound trough. In Oregon, the Willamette Valley first drew American pioneers across the continent. In California, two irrigated desert valleys provide much of the nation's produce, the Sacramento in the north and the San Joaquin to the south. The region's productive soil and temperate climate spurred westward movement even before the discovery of gold in 1848. The attraction of pioneers to the west will be a major theme of this course on the history of the American frontier beyond the Mississippi River.